idea embedded into your very being, embedded into your heart, embedded into your mind. And this idea is that you can make a difference. That you can make a difference. And so I like short sayings, and I often like to repeat a certain one throughout the sermon. And uh, this is it today. I'd like us all to uh, say this several times together. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, let's uh, read this together. I am raised to run, saved to serve, and licensed to lead. We're going to be looking at uh, Proverbs today. We've been studying the book of Proverbs. And we're going to look at what Proverbs says on the topic of leadership. But a lot of people will say to themselves, well, I'm not a leader. So they might look at this uh, sermon and say, well, this doesn't have anything to do with me because I'm not a leader. Well, I want to change that thinking. I want to change your mind that you are a leader. And not just that, but all three of these phrases have importance to them. The, the phrase, <laughs> raised to run, is referring to what Paul said in, in 2 Timothy. When he came to the end of his life, he said that I've completed the course. Paul said, I've fought the good fight, I've completed the course, I've finished the race. The one that God set for me, I've completed it. There's a crown waiting for me. And all of us are on a course. We all have been given a race to run. God has a purpose for your life. I want you to believe that. I want you to understand that. I want you to put that into your very being, into your soul. Yeah, I've got a purpose. God has a job for me to do. So that's raised to run. You're raised to run. You're in life for a purpose. And then the saved to serve is another great phrase because sometimes people will come to Jesus Christ. They'll receive him as their Lord and Savior. And they'll get their forgiveness of their sins. That's awesome. Their sins are forgiven. We are saved by grace. We don't have to work for it. We go to heaven simply by believing in God and receiving His free gift of eternal life. And, and it's great. But some people, after they're saved, they just soak and sour. Soak and sour. They just soak it all in, soak it all in. More about me, more about me, more, more, more. And then they just get sour. And they're not out serving. That's what we're supposed to do. Jesus even demonstrated that at the Last Supper. He washed the disciples' feet. He says, I've set an example for you. You are to also be a servant. You are to be serving other people. Jesus himself said, uh, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so that's what the saved to serve. And we're, we're, we're here to do, do good works, to help other people. We're saved. Let's say this all together. I am raised to run, saved to serve, and licensed to lead. Again, I am raised to run, saved to serve, and licensed to lead. You know that last part, licensed to lead. We're going to be talking about leadership today, looking at Proverbs, what it says about leadership. And some people, like I said, uh, might not think they're a leader. But here, if you've received Jesus into your life, if you've given your life over to Jesus, something happens inside of you. You know what happens? The Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you. Your body becomes a temple of the Holy Spirit. That's the power of God. And the Bible says that God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, love, and self-control. That spirit is within you. And if you have a spirit of power, love, and self-control, you're a leader. You've got so much over the rest of the world. The rest of the world, the people without the Holy Spirit in them, they don't know what they're doing. They might have leadership as a talent or gift, but they don't really know who they are. They don't know their purpose. They don't know what they're doing. You have way more understanding, authority, power if you have the Holy Spirit in you. So if, you've, if you're a believer, if you've received Jesus, you are a leader. You've been licensed to lead. You've got the Holy Spirit in you. You are a leader, so you're licensed to lead. One more time. I am raised to run, saved to serve, and licensed to lead. So if you're a leader, you need to pay attention to what we're going to study. You need to soak this in and apply it to your life today. This is Proverbs, uh, most of it written by Solomon, wisest man of his day. We're going to look at all the qualities of a good leader. I don't have time to go through each of these in detail. So uh, some of them I'll spend a lot more time on than others. Some will just go through really briefly. But in your sermon outline, I have some great quotes in there, some modern proverbs. 
that are good to stick up on your walls and put, put those in your mind, memorize them because they'll motivate you to be a good leader. So here's the first proverb I want us to look at, and I'd like us to read it together. It's Proverbs 12, 24. Let's read this. Diligent hands will rule, but laziness ends in slave labor. So that's talking about who, who, who's a leader who's going to rule? The one who works hard, the one who's diligent. So be diligent, work hard, and I've talked about this previously, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but that's part of the quality of a good leader, that you want to get in there, and you want to make sacrifices, you want to take initiative, and uh, there's a lot of other people said on that, but I'm going to just go on to the next one. Proverbs 18, 12. Let's read that together. Before his downfall, a man's heart is proud, but humility comes before honor. There's many of these uh, type of Proverbs that have the same message. It's about being humble, being humble before the Lord. An excellent leader or a successful leader must be careful not to fall into pride. It's a big danger. And I want to encourage you to not, not get so humble that you, that you don't do anything. We want to take action and initiative. But be careful of this whole concept of, it's, uh, look what I've done. You know, I'm so great. I'm so, I'm so good at this. And I just want to share from my heart something that has helped me in this area. There's a missionary woman named Heidi Baker. She's married to Rollin. They've been missionaries in Mozambique for many years. And I love to watch her on YouTube uh, uh, speak. I've seen many of her sermons. I've read her book. She is the most amazing, humble speaker I've ever heard. There's something about her that's different from everybody else. Normally, not every time, but a lot of times when she gets up to speak, she just speaks from her knees. Or she just sits on the floor and she'll spend about 15 minutes before she even talks just worshiping God. Just worshiping, <laughs> praising Him, honoring Him. And she'll say, I'm just a servant. I'm just a servant. And, and she, if you understand what happened in her life, she went as a missionary to Mozambique and served in a dump, in a city dump. She would go there and she'd give away her shoes every day. She'd just give them away and walk barefoot through the dump. She got all kinds of diseases. She worked so hard. She started an orphanage and she took in all these kids. And they just loved people. They loved people. And they had no great success. She started a small church in the dump. But she just loved those people. She's just spreading God's love and trying to feed all these homeless children and just caring about them in a very difficult country. Political crisis, horrible. There was even at one point a hitman put out to kill her. And she just loved people. And she just got closer and closer to God. And I think because of that humility and that willing to suffer and sacrifice, God just has used her in amazing ways. Her ministry now is growing. They're taking care of tens of thousands of orphans. That when family came to the country, they fed like half of Mozambique. They had ships that would just come in. Where's Heidi Baker? We've got ship full of food for you to distribute. She and her organization have planted thousands of churches. Thousands and thousands of churches. I've heard her tell stories of, of amazing miracles that happened, of, of demons being cast out, of people that were deaf, like five of this one meeting, five different deaf people, completely deaf, got healed. People, uh, just miracles after miracles after miracles. And you would think that would just go to her head and she'd be full of pride. But when you hear her speak, she says again and again, lower still. The secret of a successful ministry is lower still. Lower still. And I remember this one story that really struck me that she talked about a vision she had from God. And this vision was a small doorway. And, and to get into the room, you had to crawl. You couldn't walk. You had to get on your face and crawl in through that doorway. And the doorway was God's blessings and all these miracles and things. But she says to get into this, into, the, into this room, you had to just humble your heart, humble yourself, and go, God, it's all about you. I'm just your servant. I'll do whatever you say. Heidi Baker, 
I want to share her story because it, it, it's, it's impacted me. And, and if you ever get a chance to go on YouTube and listen, put Heidi Baker, just listen to any of her messages. They're, they're powerful and they will help you stay away from pride. Because she got, she, she got all these diseases. She almost died. She was dying. The doctor says, you've been in the garbage too long and you've got all these diseases and you're just going to die. Shame on you. You shouldn't have been there. And uh, God miraculously healed her, but she was in, in terrible pain for a long time, suffering. But because of that, God could use her in such great, great ways. Uh, next one, Proverbs 18, 13. Let's read this together. He who answers before listening, that is his folly and shame. This whole concept is very important that a leader needs to listen. A leader needs to think of teamwork. Teamwork makes the dream work. And this is, this is a good, uh, this is a good one here. Uh, yeah, listen to others before answering. Listen, uh, make, make it a team effort. I like this quote. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. care. You've heard that before. That's very important. If you're going to be a leader, show that you're not just using people. Uh, don't just be task oriented. Uh, that, that you need to be people oriented. You need to build relationships. Leadership is positional, but it's also relational. That that's what counts. And, and uh, John Maxwell, who's an expert in leadership, he once said, people don't quit jobs. They quit bosses. Interesting, right? Yeah, it's because the relationship is, is terrible. So, so the, you want to have good relationships if you're going to be a leader. Here we go again. Let's uh, say this again. I am raised to run, saved to serve, and licensed to lead. Here's the next Proverbs 15.31. Let's read this together. He who listens to a life-giving rebuke will be at home among the wise. This isn't the only proverb that says that several of them talk about that. Be able to take correction. Be able to take a rebuke. Now, I want to talk about this a little bit. It's not easy to take criticism. But if you're a leader, it's going to come. If you're in charge of anything, some criticism is going to come one way or another. And that's actually a good thing because, look at this quote. Uh, well, constructive, you want to have constructive correction. That's, uh, you can profit from that, but this is a good quote. Okay, ready? It's from John Maxwell. When you get kicked in the rear, you're, you know you're out in front, right? Okay? That's, you're a leader because you got kicked in the rear. And so criticism is going to come. It's always been this way. Aristotle, this is a quote from Aristotle. Criticism is something you can avoid easily by saying nothing, doing nothing, and being nothing. Just be nothing, and you won't get any criticism. But if you do anything, it's going to come. Now, I want to tell you, I want to tell you this. A lot of criticism that comes, you need to be like wheat and, and the tares. You know, wheat and tares, it's like weeds and wheat. You need to just get rid of the ones that aren't helpful and keep the ones that are. You might get 10 comments about how you're doing, and eight of them will be no good. Eight of them will just be negative and will discourage you. But just discard those. Are you mature enough? I mean, there's some people, they get one negative word, and oh, I'm not going to volunteer at the church anymore because someone said a nasty thing about me. <laughs> Are, aren't you mature enough? Can't you take it? You're a leader. You've got the Holy Spirit in you. You should be able to take some criticism. So what? They didn't know what they're talking about. Be able to take it. Come on. And, and so the criticism comes. You evaluate it. But never get to the point where, no, no, I'm not going to hear any correction. No. Take it in. Listen. And you always grow. When you're, when you're through improving, you're through. So just keep improving, right? Keep taking taking the, the, the good things that are going to be helpful and apply those. It's just like, okay, this is just a minor thing, but uh, I'm not the greatest speller, all right? So sometimes on the sign or, or songs or there's misspelling. Tell me so I can correct it. You don't hurt my feelings. It's like, yeah, okay, well, I'll get corrected. Many times people call me, the sign's wrong. You know, I'm standing right there and I'm like, I can't see it, I can't see it. You know, it's misspelled, you know, so I just I go out there right away and try to correct the spell. Sometimes they say, did you do that on purpose, Brad? <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to see if you would catch it. Yeah. All on purpose. So, but 
we need to be that way. To, to just keep listening. And if you're wise, you can take it and you can throw out the junk that doesn't help you and keep the, the jewels that, that are good, that are going to help you improve in your leadership. So that's another point. Uh, your big, this is John Maxwell. He was a pastor, very successful author, expert on leadership. I love his books. Um, your biggest mistake is, to not, is not asking what mistake you're making. Be open. Be open to that. All right, so here we go again. I am raised to run, saved to serve, and licensed to lead. Okay, uh, this is another one. 1623, let's read this together. A wise man's heart guides his mouth, and his lips promote instruction. All right, this is also important for a leader to be a teacher, to be someone that trains people. You know, it's, it's not just about, okay, do this, do that, do that. It's not just about making decisions, commanding people. It's about training people. You always want to be bringing someone along with you and, and showing them the way and teaching them how to do it. And you know a great leader, especially from my perspective in, in a church setting, you, you know, mostly volunteers, right? But if you're leading something and then you're going to move or you're going to you know, go somewhere else, Train your replacement. You know, it's like, I don't want to have to train someone. Why don't you go ahead? It, before you leave this church, you've got to train someone to take your place, everything you were doing, right? That's a great leader, training people to take your place. And it's a very simple process. It's like, uh, this, is, this is a process. I do it, you watch. You do it, I watch. And then you do it. I'm not even watching anymore. Just report back to me. How's it going? That's the process that we, we need to engage in and, and train people. Keep training people. It's part of being a great leader. Be uh, also a teacher. All right, uh, here we go again. I'm ready to run, safe to serve, and licensed to lead. Okay, this last section is the longest section in Proverbs that has to do with leadership altogether. All right, it's well written. I really like it. This is not by King Solomon. It's by uh, uh, King Limel. Well, actually his mother. So I'm going to read it, and you listen to it, and then there's three different principles here that we can learn from. The sayings of King Limel. An oracle his mother taught him. O oh my son, O oh son of my womb, O oh son of my vows, do not spend your strength on women, your vigor on those who ruin kings. It is not for kings, O oh Limel, not for kings to drink wine, not for rulers to crave beer. Least they drink and forget what the law decrees, and deprive all the oppressed of their rights. Give beer to those who are perishing, wine to those who are in anguish. Let them drink and forget their poverty, and remember their misery no more. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly, defend the rights of the poor and needy. Good passage for leaders, not just kings. But this part here, I'm going to explain this. They're not spending your strength on women. All right, so this is not talking about a good marriage. All right, so you should have a good marriage and a good sexual relationship with your spouse. Okay, that's, that's good. That's helpful for, for a leader. But in those days, kings could have as many wives as they wanted. In fact, the Bible says Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And it says that when he grew old, his foreign wives led him astray. It ruined him. It ruined him. This is so true. Solomon is in writing this because he blew it. He had way too many women. And, and so it's, and it's, it's just wrong. You're going you're gonna to mess up your life. So as a leader, don't waste your energy on sexual pleasure. That's, that's what I'm, uh, even today, we have lots of examples in the Bible. Samson, he was supposed to be one of the judges, leaders of Israel. And what did Samson do? He had all this strength and he wasted, he was sleeping with the enemy, right? Samson and Delilah, Delilah. yeah, yeah. You know, and if the movie does it well, she's a pretty conniving, manipulative woman. And what was he after? He was after sex, okay? I'm just going to put it out there. He, he, that's what he wanted. And it ruined him. He ended up with a haircut and blind. Yeah. yeah. So, but it doesn't seem to be enough. And then we look at David. 
that David and uh, who did he commit adultery with? Bathsheba. Yeah, yeah, we know their names, right? David and Bathsheba. And that led to all kinds of problems in his family. David, I could go on and on. I could, I could give you a dozen different examples of people in leadership in our day and age who have ruined their careers, ruined their reputations by this problem. When are we going to learn? This is a major thing for leaders. Stay away from sexual sin. Now this next one is, oh yeah, this is a good quote. Integrity and character always matter more than skill, talent, and genius. Integrity and character. For the long term, that's what matters. All right. The next section was all about drinking. Kings, you know, a lot of kings in the Old Testament, they just get drunk and throw huge parties all the time. It was just party, party. But the, the uh, mother is saying, hey, a king's job is to judge justly. Hey, and if you're drunk, you're not going to be able to do your job. And so she says, don't be pursuing alcohol. Now, it's not a sin to drink. Jesus turned water into wine. Yeah, yeah. So did Jesus drink? Yeah, yeah he did. He did. So it's not a sin to drink. It's not a sin to social, uh, social drinking. But if that's your pursuit, if that's what you've uh, become an alcoholic or you're getting drunk, the Bible does say that's wrong. And, and my uncle was an alcoholic, so I have a strong opinion about this. It's maybe um, even more than, than, the, than what the Bible says. But it's just so dangerous. It can ruin your life. It definitely ruins, ruins your leadership. And so um, I want to I show you some billboards that are the world's opinion of alcohol. And I'm going to contrast that with what was just said. The, what was just said was that um, what's, what's a beer for and wine for? They're for the destitute, right? They're for the dying. They're for those that aren't doing anything and just want to forget their pain. But if, for you, if you are a leader and you're a leader, stay away from it. It's not going to do you any good. So um, here's what the world will preach on the subject of alcohol. And this is famous. This is in, in Las Vegas, you'll see these billboards all over the place, but it's famous around the country. Alcohol, it's cheaper than therapy. Alcohol doesn't solve problems, but neither does milk. I'm on a liquor diet. I've already lost three days. What are they doing? They're just making fun of it, right? Oh yeah, it's alcohol is a lot of fun. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Here's two more. Alcohol, according to science, is a solution. Oh. Is that true, Jim? A solution in science, okay. So here's the last one. Warning, the consumption of alcohol may cause pregnancy. <laughs> they had, no, they're just making, oh, it's just a big party. But the Bible is saying, watch out, it's so dangerous. I wish the following three sayings were on billboards instead. These are sayings I wish they put on billboards. Poverty never drives a man to drink, but drinking will drive a man to poverty. Put that on a billboard, okay? I'd like to see that around. Um, drinking is a subject that floors a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, someone with a lot of money, stick that up on a billboard, okay? <laughs> All right, now here's another one. Nothing can hold liquor as well as a bottle, so why not leave it there? <laughs> Good one. That's, that's just uh, my opinion as well as uh, perspective. Uh, so the last, the third main point of that passage we read in Proverbs 31 is give justice to the poor and needy. Do your job. Judge fairly. Speak up for those that can't speak for themselves. That's what it says. Speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. And John Maxwell says this, influence exists to speak up for those that don't have influence. And this is my, this is my opinion of the United States, that the people with the least amount of influence, the people that cannot speak up for themselves, that are the most hunted down in America, are the unborn babies. And there's a million abortions in America a year. And if you want to know what those clinics are doing, Watch the movie Unplanned. It will blow your mind as to what's going on in our country. It's a true story. See the movie Unplanned. Because these people, these unborn children, have no voice. No one's speaking well. Few people are speaking up for them on their behalf. Now, there's many other groups. And God has called each of us to different arenas, different areas. But you need to do what God's called you to do 
to do what's right, speak up for the poor, the needy, do your job, because you're a leader. Now, I want to end with a, a story that, uh, to me, was one of the most powerful uh, uh, TED Talks that I've ever seen. I'm going to show you a picture of this gentleman. <coughs> this is uh, Aaron Stark. And I felt this was very timely for what's just happened with all the shootings. Aaron Stark, you can find his uh, message, TED Talks on YouTube, it's called, I Almost Was a School Shooter. I Almost Was a School Shooter. And he tells his story. Aaron grew up in a family where his mother and father were very violent, and they were drug addicts. And so they were very abusive to him, both physically and verbally. He grew up in a family where they were constantly running from the police. So he moved from school to school to school to school, sometimes several or more schools in, a, in one year. He was always the new kid. And when he went to school, because of his drug addict appearance, he never bathed. He never had clean clothes. He went to school, and he smelled. He, was, he stunk. And he was fat. He was way overweight. And so the kids teased him. He was bullied at school. But when he came home, he was bullied at home. His parents constantly told him, you are worthless. And after hearing that year after year after year, you're worthless, you're worthless, you're worthless, he began to believe it. Life at home was hell. And by age 14, he was so down and distressed and discouraged that he started cutting himself. He still has the scars to this day of, of cutting, just to try to deal with the pain in his life. He felt life was worth worthless. He hated himself. He hated the world. He hated everybody. When he was uh, 14 uh, uh, or 15 years old, his own parents uh, kicked him out of the house. He had nowhere to live. He had to live uh, here and there. He, he was living in a shed of one of his friends. He just let the uh, family let him live in the shed. And one day he was sitting there about age 15, filthy, dirty, depressed, down, didn't know what to do. He's going to kill himself. He said, I'll call social services. So he called social services. And this woman came and picked him up. But she not only picked him up, she went and found his mother. And brought her along with him. And he poured out all the things that they'd done to him. All the horrible stuff that happened to him. And his mother said, oh, none of that's true. She was an expert liar. And she convinced the social service lady that everything he was saying was just made up. And so she, the social service lady just sent him back with his mother, who then abused him more, put him down more, even gave him razor blades and said, next time you want to kill yourself, here, use these. He then had nowhere to live, went back, lived in that shed, nowhere to go, nothing, no one loved him. Even this friend, this one friend, he'd lied to, he'd, he'd stolen things from him. He said he was going to, he made a plan, he was going to uh, do a mass shooting, he was going to go to the school, he hardly ever went to school, but he knew where the school was, and he ate every, he was going to kill as many people as he could and kill himself. And he had it all planned out. He just needed a gun, and so he went to a game, and he said, I, I need a gun. And uh, they promised to get him one, but they never did. So he was so depressed. He was homicidal. He was suicidal. At age 16, uh, 19, I forget the year, 1996, I believe, uh, he, uh, he had all his plans and uh, going to do this mass shooting that, that wasn't working out, so he was going to kill himself. And this one friend he had, he, uh, he just started to um, say, hey, is there anything I can do for you? He was just kind. He just showed him love. At this point in the TED Talk, he says, we need to show love to those that deserve it the least because they need it the most. What a powerful statement. This one friend just showed him attention, showed him kindness. That kept him from killing himself at that time. A little while later, he's going to kill himself again. And this other friend uh, invited him to this party. It was his birthday. He says, I will not live past tonight. My birthday, I'm going to kill myself at midnight. And he gets invited to this party, gets there, and it's a surprise birthday party. They had blueberry pie for him. And he was so shocked that anyone cared about him, that anyone showed any love to him. And, and that kept him from killing himself. And through, through the years, he was able to grow up. He was able to go to therapy. 
And it took a long time for him to get over all those wounds and all those hurts. But if you watch this video, the most powerful point is when he's standing there and he's told his story and he says, I made it through. I'm now happily married and the father of four and my wife and daughter are in the audience. And the people just burst into applause. They just burst into applause. And then he even goes on from there. And he said, that friend, that one friend who saved my life, we are still friends and he's in the audience. And again, the, the, the audience just bursts into, into uh, applause, and he's crying, and, and I'm crying as I'm watching it, and uh, half the audience is crying. And he ends his, his, his talk by saying, what we need is to show love to those that don't deserve our love, because they need it the most. And then the audience just stands to their feet, and there's just this standing ovation. It's one of the most emotional TED Talks I've ever seen. And I thought, what a lesson that you can make a difference. You can be like that friend who just showed kindness, who even though it, this guy had stolen from him, he was like, OK, Aaron, so how are you doing? What can we do together? Uh, throwing a party for somebody. Just showing love and kindness. That's what leaders do, and they make a difference in this world. So I, I just want to show you this picture here. This is what he looked like at 16. This is his wife, and uh, there he is today. And make a mark, leave a legacy. You are licensed to lead. Let's end with this. I'm raised to run. I'm saved to serve. I'm licensed to lead.